We're transitioning into our energy tech talk panel. So for all the energy nerds, get ready. We're going to get into it and, and, and get real. Um, please welcome our panelists. And Jay, if you'll roll that beautiful bee footage. <laughs> So in Kentucky, we're uh, a day's drive to two thirds of the United States population. That puts us at a logistical <laughs> advantage in terms of alternative fuels like electric vehicles, but also for hydrogen. We're partnering with multiple partners, Toyota being one of them, on what does hydrogen corridors look like to connect Canada down through the Southeast and Kentucky is that essential connector state for alternative fuels. Well, I like to think we're uh, leaders at this point in time, really pushing the corridors, uh, trying to get the infrastructure. Our Office of Energy Policy and our Executive Director, Kenya Stump, is really working diligently to try to form some partnerships with surrounding states to be a hydrogen uh, hub here in Kentucky. I think for a lot of people, it's just they don't know anything about it. It seems kind of science fiction, if you will, to be able to make hydrogen and run vehicles off of it. It's just a, such a new technology for a lot of people. They're just really not well versed in it. I think that's going to change in a very short amount of time, kind of like 10 years ago when we were all thinking about solar on roofs and uh, industrial size solar. A hydrogen fuel cell vehicle is very similar to an electric vehicle except that you're producing the electricity through the fuel cell using hydrogen. And hydrogen is a, is a great energy carrier. It's very energy dense. And so what the fuel cell does is it unlocks that energy from the hydrogen, converts it to electricity. And the nice thing is the only emissions you get are water out of the tailpipe. It's sort of the cleanest kind of race car experience you can have in a passenger vehicle. All right, um, they told me I had to use this mic today since the, the mic yesterday didn't like me very well. So uh, we have a great panel today. I'm so excited. I'm really excited that when I call people and say, hey, can you do me a favor, that they say sure. <laughs> so we have a great panel today. We have uh, representatives who's going to talk to us today about everything from hydrogen to renewable natural gas, um, advanced nuclear, small modular reactors, sustainable aviation fuel, and, and, and I think maybe we can even get a little carbon capture in on it as well. So with us today, I'm gonna go through our panelists. They'll have some time to kinda uh, give a little bit of overview of what they're working on, who they represent, uh, what the, why they're working in this space. And then we'll do a little, um, what I call, I get to be Oprah, and I get to do a little Q&A, and we're gonna have a conversation up here about uh, advancing these new technologies. But before that, I'd like to recognize uh, my Office of Energy Policy staff. Lona Brewer in the back is with us today, Carol Stringer, and our fabulous intern, Haley Mattingly. Um, we couldn't be here today without our intern program and giving our interns experience, experiences like this and, and meeting industry professionals. But before I begin into our bios, a little bit about the Office of Energy Policy. Uh, we're a non-regulatory group, very small. Uh, we oversee Kentucky's energy strategy. We also uh, do give out some money, but I don't have it yet, so. <laughs> uh, but more to come on that. Uh, we also uh, work on um, everything in between from monitoring our fuels for energy security uh, to working with all of these new technologies. Uh, we support all of Kentucky's energy resources. Um, and the utilization of those throughout the Commonwealth. But today, to kick off our panel, first we have Brett Radulovich. Brett is currently the Vice President of Strategy and Risk Operations for NYSource, a role he has held since the beginning of 2021. In this role, he leads a team responsible for delivering comprehensive strategic and risk analysis and innovative solutions across the enterprise. He is also an executive co-lead of NYSource's Your Energy, Your Future, 
um, strategic priority and a member of the company's benefits committee. He previously served as a strategy and risk integration director, director of procurement operations and assistant treasurer. Brett believes that the strategic initiatives being driven today are critical to positioning NYSource as a premium utility that can create long-term risk-adjusted value for our stakeholders in equitable energy transition. That's a mouthful, Brett, that you're responsible for there. Um, Brett has worked uh, in various finance roles with Ashland Inc. in both uh, Dublin, Ohio and Covington, Kentucky offices. Outside of work, he serves on the board of the Children Hungers Alliance, a statewide nonprofit organization in Ohio dedicated to ending childhood hunger. He also has a five-year-old at home, so everybody just give, give him a little grace. <laughs> Brett holds a BS in business administration from Bowling, Bowling Green State University and an MBA from Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. I went to IU too. Don't tell anybody. And a non-practicing CPA registration from the state of Ohio. So please welcome Brett to the panel. So Brett, I'd like for you to just give everyone, we've heard a lot about hydrogen. I'm a big fan too of what's happening on renewable natural gas. Uh, give us a little flavor for um, NYSource's um, kind of view on what's happening in those spaces and, and what you're seeing uh, in the future of NYSource as it relates to that. Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. So um, we're, you know, we're pretty large overall, pretty large natural gas distribution company. We also have an electric business in, in Indiana. And in the bio, it mentioned the equitable energy transition. And when, when we think about, when NYSWORS thinks about an equitable energy transition, it's embracing, you know, sustainability and, and the drive towards decarbonization over the long period but not losing focus on things like safety, reliability, resiliency, and affordability for all of our customers. Um, and when we think about the energy transition, we think it's very important that, um, that we utilize the existing infrastructure that we have in place, including the, the natural gas systems that we have in place. And RNG and hydrogen present a opportunity to use our existing infrastructure and help drive that economy-wide decarbonization over time. RNG probably represents a nearer term opportunity than hydrogen, and that's just because of the, the chemistry of RNG is essentially the same as geologic natural gas. Um, and so what we're doing on the RNG front is we've actually, we have um, in Indiana uh, two large RNG producers that are actually connected to our systems and, and putting, putting their RNG into our systems. And, and through our systems are flowing that to end markets um, outside of our territories. Uh, we've also uh, created standardized um, RNG gas quality standards across all of our six states. Um, and, and we've recently rolled out a new process to make it easier for RNG producers to um, connect to our systems and um, ho over, hopefully help them increase the supply of RNG economy wide. When we look at RNG, the, the issue right now is um, RNG is much more expensive than, than geological natural gas. And that's driven by incentives, both federal and state in incentives um, in the transportation fuels area that are really driving up the, the cost of RNG. So we think that if we can help producers increase supply of RNG overall, it will help to moderate those prices and make them uh, more affordable for end use customers on, on the utility side. Um, we're also looking at, across you know, all of our states, ways that we can uh, create programs for customers to voluntarily opt into uh, a decarbonized gas package that may include um, some, some percentage of RNG, renewable natural gas, and car uh, carbon offsets uh, to help them reduce their, their carbon footprint. So uh, a few things that we're working on within RNG. And then I would point to, in some states, you're seeing constructive legislation. Like, for example, in Virginia, they recently passed what we call the biogas bill that um, has some innovative policy in it, which would allow utilities to 
rate-based some investments for RNG production um, and sell some of that RNG to its customers, some of that RNG to the, um, the transportation markets in California and, and other states that, that are driving the high prices and return some of those profits from the, the sale to the transportation market to customers so that the overall cost to customers would be at or around the cost of geological natural gas. So there are some things on the policy side that, that can be done. We're seeing Minnesota, Virginia, I think Tennessee has some uh, constructive legislation around RNG that, um, that we're looking to see if we could bring to, bring to the states that we operate in. When you look at hydrogen, like I said, it's a, it's a longer term play for us. Uh, we see applications for hydrogen both in electric production in Indiana and, and on the gas side. Um, on the gas side, uh, you know, GTI, um, um, AGA, um, and, and others have done studies showing that um, a blend of natural gas and hydrogen, where hydrogen's up to 20% of the blend, um, could be safe uh, for, for customers and um, not impact the end use, uh, their in, end use appliances. Uh, we're actually starting a hydrogen pilot in our Columbia Gas of Pennsylvania Training Center right now uh, to validate some of those findings. At, um, so we're, we're testing blends of hydrogen and natural gas at different levels and trying to understand what the impact on our assets are, but also the impact on the end user experience through, through different appliances. Uh, we're also involved in a number of um, hydrogen hub proposals, including uh, the hydrogen hub proposal the secretary just talked about in the last session um, and you know we operate in indiana ohio kentucky pennsylvania all of which are very active um, on the hydrogen hub front so uh, there's a lot going on within within hydrogen um, like i said a longer term play the the key constraint i think to hydrogen is um, one the cost uh, it's uh, significantly higher cost for clean hydrogen than natural gas right now um, some of the legislation at the, on the federal side, the um, Infrastructure and, um, Investment and Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act can help bring that down those costs or drive, uh, drive innovation that can bring down those costs, uh, but it's, it is going to be a longer term play for us. All right, next we have, uh, we're gonna transition from renewable natural gas um, and hydrogen to advanced nuclear. Uh, something that um, I, I really enjoy uh, working on and working with the partners in this space. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Caitlin with our partnership with GAIN and of course uh, our partnership uh, with TVA here in Kentucky. So Caitlin is the strategic consultant to the senior vice president on the Clinch River Nuclear Project. TVA's near-term pursuit for deploying a small modular reactor at the Clinch River nuclear site under the recently established new nuclear program. She has a uniquely diverse background in civil engineering consulting, civil and construction, uh, higher education and program management. Her experience supports several key project initiatives, including the engagement and education of stakeholders through outreach events, the establishment foundational project infrastructure and workforce development. For over a decade, Caitlin has been involved in the architecture, construction and engineering mentoring program. I really haven't had enough coffee to say that. <laughs> a national nonprofit that promotes the ACE career fields through mentorship and real world projects. She is currently serving as the president of the board of directors of Southeast Tennessee and North Georgia affiliate of ACE. Developing a construction workforce to support new nuclear construction will be essential to the success future de deployments of SMRs and provide robust careers for the next generation. Uh, Caitlin is excited about TVA's path and we're gonna hear more about that to decarbonization by 2050. And she also um, uh, has three children and, uh, and her husband and they enjoy um, um, uh, what the future holds for her children in terms of uh, clean energy future that TVA is working on. So Caitlin, Caitlin has some slides and do you have your clicker? Yes, clicker. okay. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll give it to you, Caitlin, to tell us what's going on with Clinch River and how, that, how SMRs may play into our future. Great, well, thank you. I'm excited to be here with you all today. I appreciate the invitation. 
Um, I'm here again representing the Tennessee Valley Authority, and specifically I'll be speaking to our pursuit of advanced nuclear. So TVA has uh, been pursuing advanced nuclear for almost 10 years. We've been evaluating different technologies, and only since February has TVA made a, the decision to continue that pursuit through the Clinch River Nuclear Project uh, with a specific technology at that site in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, but we are also continuing to evaluate technologies because they're continuing to develop. So um, there's a program that's continuing to look at that as well as future sites for new nuclear. So TVA said, if we build one of these plants, we will be able to build several of them across the valley. So um, the reason I really enjoy working for TVA is, is its rich history. And I think as we look at new technologies for power generation, we have a lot to learn from our history. So TVA was, was birthed out of innovation uh, with the TVA Act in 1933, and that was to get the United States out of the Great Depression. And over time, uh, we, we went on to pursue uh, the construction of our hydro plants. That was the largest construction, hydro construction project ever undertaken uh, at that point in time in history. We continued to meet the demands of our, our, the people. So power generation, we needed more power. We went on to pursue uh, fossil into nuclear. And then you can see pumped uh, storage and gas. So TVA has always been working to respond to the needs of the people in the valley. We have kind of three key tenants that we speak to. Energy, uh, the environment, we don't think those are mutually exclusive. We can, we can have both. Um, and there's tremendous economic development benefits from seeing, uh, seeing energy and environment in that lens. And so now our new challenge in 2020 and beyond is to not just provide power for the valley, because as was mentioned earlier, electric vehicles are becoming very popular. People are gonna be plugging in all over the valley, um, and we've gotta be able to supply the increase in power that's gonna come with that. Um, but as we increase power supply, we've also got to reduce carbon. So uh, this, that's why you're hearing from all of us today. Um, and so uh, TVA is really going to be looking at all of the opportunities in which we can do that. So TVA is approaching this very holistically, but we really see small modular reactors um, serving as a key baseload power for our power generating portfolio moving forward. Um, we're continuing to pursue uh, solar, pump storage, carbon capture, and other technologies that you'll hear, hear about. But in we have a rich history in construction and nuclear power. We operate the third largest nuclear power um, fleet in the nation. And, uh, and so this history has really teed us up nicely for um, exploring small modular reactors. A small modular reactor, if you're not familiar with that, an SMR, I know there's a lot of acronyms out there in this new technology space. Um, they are, uh, they're similar to currently operating reactors. So in terms of technology transitions, it's, a, it's an easier transition as opposed to kind of some brand new technology. Um, but it will produce about a third of the power of a, a larger plant. And the benefits of that is kind of being able to distribute that more across the grid. Um, and so there's, uh, uh, TVA is excited. We think that advanced nuclear is gonna play a key role and TVA is clean, clean energy future. I'm back. <laughs> um, Caitlin, just as a follow up real quick, um, a little bit about Clinch River. Could you just give a little bit of overview before we transition to Seth? Sure, Clint, so the Clinch River Nuclear Project uh, is uh, again our near, near term deployment. So it's at the Oak Ridge site. We are evaluating a, a specific technology, light water technology that's similar to currently operating reactors. Um, the project team is forming now. We're doing a lot of economic development impact studies so we can understand impacts of the region. We're also looking at that programmatically. Um, and that, uh, that project will really be an opportunity for TVA not only to uh, kind of lead in the, in the United States in, the, in that particular technology, but also for, uh, for the nation to kind of learn from uh, small modular reactors. All right, thank you, Caitlin. And now we're gonna transition to um, Seth Cutter. Seth is the Director of Public Affairs for the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport, the seventh largest cargo airport in North America, 
and the 2022 Best Airport in North America for Staff Service. In his role, Seth develops and executes CVG's local, state, and federal policy priorities. He represents CVG to local stakeholders and leads the team responsible for airport public relations, communications, marketing, and community affairs. Seth joined CVG in 2017, previously having worked in the Campbell County, Kentucky Judge Executive's Office. He remains active in the community, serving on a variety of committee, committees and working groups for the Northern Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, Northern Kentucky Triad, Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, and the o Ohio Aviation Association. He is a member of the 2021 Cincinnati 40 Under 40 class, is on the board of the KBT, Kentuckians for Better Transportation and Foreign Trade Zones 46 and 47 in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. Seth completed his undergraduate studies at American University in Washington, D.C. and earned an MPA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We will not hold that against you today. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm really happy to have Seth here because yesterday we touched on sustainable aviation fuel as it relates to uh, BDO zones opportunities. Seth has uh, formed a coalition in Northern Kentucky around uh, sustainable aviation fuel. And Seth, I'd like you to just talk to us about um, the why on SAF and, and why it's so important to CVG and economic development in, in your area. Well, thank you, Kenya. I'd love to talk about those things. And please don't hold my Tar Heel <laughs> status against me. Um, out of all the folks in this room, I'm probably one of the only political scientists, so I apologize in advance if it gets too, you know, policy-oriented. But um, no, thank you, Kenya, and to the cabinet for having us. It's always a pleasure to talk about SAF, and I think, as Kenya mentioned, right, it was a, a topic of conversation yesterday, but one in which we are we're fully invested at CBG and really across Kentucky. I think as we, you know, the, the topic of our, our session now, thinking about emerging um, and growing technologies. SAF is certainly um, s not new uh, in terms of uh, it is a, a fundamental kind of building block of the future of aviation, but certainly kind of when you dig a little bit deeper, um, the pathways, right, the feedstocks are certainly the technology for each kind of uh, functional area uh, continues to um, rapidly uh, uh, develop. Uh, and we're very, I think, blessed in Kentucky to have folks at, um, at UK, at CAER, and others looking at uh, both the R&D elements of the different technologies, and then, of course, I think what, what sets Kentucky apart, right, are of the seven approved pathways to uh, blending SAF, that we have such an abundant supply in Kentucky of, obviously, Woody Biomass, um, HEFA uh, technologies as each pathway builds out, I think there's tremendous opportunity, alcohol to fuel, um, so much untapped potential, right? And that's really where, Kenya, to your, to your question, where our interest comes in, right? So we, about a year and a half, two years ago, really uh, came together with a lot of our aviation stakeholders in Kentucky, right? I think many in this room know that aviation and aerospace are key, just as much as horses and bourbon, <coughs> are key industries and energy for Kentucky, and, and SAP is certainly the perfect, I say, perfect blend of, of economic development, energy, and um, aviation and aerospace, right? So uh, we've got our, our CVG folks together, of course, DHL and Amazon have uh, large uh, cargo hubs at the airport, and then, of course, our partners down in Louisville at, U, uh, at UPS and both the Louisville Airport, everybody kind of banded together um, particularly from a policy perspective, because Brett, as you were describing with RNG, the, the real kind of issue at scaling up SAF production is certainly cost, uh, as is, is the case with many of these technologies, and a concerted effort uh, and, and common cause banded this coalition together to really address that cost and the leadership position that's at stake for Kentucky, right? So um, we're very proud that we've gotten more folks, both uh, with presence inside the state uh, and outside of it. We've got Boeing involved, some of the OEMs, um, uh, all from an aviation perspective, but potential users, airlines like Southwest and American Airlines 
who really see SAF, right, and I think, I apologize if this is repetitive, but truly see SAF is the short and medium term solution to decarbonizing aviation. While aviation emissions only account, I think, for what, two or three percent of global CO2 and GHG emissions, it is the hardest to decarbonize, right? We're looking at things like hydrogen and electrifying fleets of ground support equipment at airports, which is obviously, you know, uh, ground, ground source emissions, but um, electric aviation is still quite a ways away. We have folks like DHL that are investing in those technologies in electric aircraft, and obviously eVTOL, other types of kind of uh, different technologies are already revolutionizing the space, but when you think about conventional jet fuel, right, conventional jet A, SAF is the best near-term solution because it is a drop-in fuel, right? It can be totally commingled uh, with, uh, you know, kerosene-based jet A. The infrastructure is the same, right? So from an airport perspective, our fuel farms, our, um, you know, pipe and other transport of, of fuel uh, can remain largely the same. Uh, and it really becomes a question of how quickly can you spool up production, right? So um, I talk too much, as Kenya knows, but you're, this you're is certainly good. this is certainly kind of the key point for us in Kentucky is really on a production side. How do we incentivize truly from an energy but also economic development opportunity, really incentivize and spool up the production of SAF? here in Kentucky, because between UPS, DHL, and Amazon, we have the scale already, uh, collectively, uh, we burn through hundreds of millions of gallons of gas a year at our three major commercial airports, but then you also have, you know, 55 other general aviation airports across our state. If you uh, kind of combine all that scale potential, we really have an opportunity, and again, as, as has been noted, we're at that perfect crossroads to distribute um, product and export um, the production of, or, or creation of SAF uh, to our neighboring states as well. Uh, so that's really what's in it for us and from a policy perspective, we're certainly uh, heartened and I'm sure we'll talk more about actions at the federal level with uh, the SAF uh, Blenders tax credit that was included in the Inflation Reduction Act and then also the SAF Ground Challenge that the DOE and DOT and EPA and USDA have now, you know, uh, put full force behind and just released a few weeks ago. So we'll, I'll shut up for now so we can talk more later. So now that you've learned that a new acronym, now you've got SAF and SMRs, and we're just going to keep rolling on, the, on that uh, with um, EPRI. So I'm very uh, fortunate to have uh, Jeffrey Priest here. Uh, Jeffrey and I met um, at EPRI's uh, Low Carbon Research Initiative Conference. When was that? Was two or three weeks ago. Two or three weeks ago. It seems a really long time ago. Um, and um, we sort of did a trade. I said, I'll come to yours if you come to mine. And so Jeffrey agreed to come here. But what I was really impressed with is um, EPRI. Uh, is sort of a leader in, in, in as far as working with their members and utilities in, in the research space and their low carbon research initiative. They've done some really uh, spectacular modeling work of late. And so I thought, well, Jeffrey, can you come here and talk to us about all things EPRI and low carbon research initiative as well as uh, some of your latest modeling results, but a little bit more about Jeffrey before I turn it over to him. Jeffrey Price is the Director of Research and Development at the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. In this role, Jeffrey is focused on developing world-class research portfolios to support the energy economy transition to a net zero emissions future. Jeffrey serves as EPRI's lead on the joint EPRI GTIE Low Carbon Research Initiative. Um, give me time there. Um, and. Um, EPRI's research portfolio is focused on long duration bulk energy storage, advanced power generation cycles, CO2 capture and storage, and net zero industrial clusters. I'd love to learn more about that too. Uh, Jeffrey earned a, an MBA from Wake Forest University and a BS in chemical engineering from North Carolina State University. 
So welcome, Jeffrey, and let me get you the clicker, yeah, too. Well, I can tell you, Kenya, that we definitely got the better end of that bargain. We appreciate you coming <laughs> to, to Louisville and speaking to our members. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and uh, it's very interesting to be here talking about the future of energy systems with you because, as you heard from uh, Secretary Goodman, Secretary Gray, there's a lot of really interesting things happening in Kentucky that span uh, the optionality that we believe is needed to support a net zero future for everyone going into the next couple of decades. Uh, so EPRI is a nonprofit organization. We started 50 years ago this year uh, where we've been leading objective independent science research demonstration, uh, looking at the energy value chain, but also energy across a wide, uh, wide portfolio. We launched a couple years ago the LCRI with a partnership with GTI Energy. Uh, there's 53 companies that are actively engaged in this, a couple local ones here, LG&E and KU, NISource, East Kentucky Power Cooperative, Duke Energy, TVA, amongst others. Uh, and so we're very grateful to have their support and engagement in this effort. EPRI looks at a variety of technologies. As I mentioned, as a nonprofit, we're not out there to commercialize or uh, select or pick the best. We're there to help society and our members understand the values and the trade-offs of technology. So it makes it really exciting to talk about the future because we hope that as many of these technologies have already been spoken to on the panel and some yesterday uh, come out into the, fold, into the fold to help support equitable decarbonization, as Brett said, in a way that's reliable, resilient, and affordable and safe. Everything we come to expect when we turn on the lights, when we heat our homes, when we get in our cars, all of that, the things that we forget about, that we take for granted, we want to keep forgetting about them as we go into this decarbonized future. So. One of the things that we've been working on, there's, there's a slide here and, and a QR code. If you can take out your phone, it'll take you right to the analysis. A few weeks ago, we released our analysis of technologies and pathways to achieve net zero decarbonization <clears throat> across the entire energy system. So that's electric, that's gas, that's transportation, that's industry uh, by 2050. And the way that we did that, and the QR code's on this slide as well, we looked at a number of scenarios to show how the availability of technologies and availability of options could drastically change the deployment and the costs of energy going forward. So you can see these graphs show you various trends of deployment over various decades uh, of different technologies. A lot of them we've talked about, nuclear, hydrogen, CCS, renewable fuels. And you can see that those trends vary differently based on the three scenarios that we model. Now this is a model, it's a thought exercise, it's not a prediction of the future, it's kind of where we see the future of technologies going based on where we sit today. So we're probably wrong, because we're always wrong uh, in general, but uh, we don't pretend to have you know, the, the crystal ball that's gonna predict the future. But what you're seeing here are three major scenarios that could drastically impact technology transitions. The first one is what we call the all options case. So that's where we say, much like you've heard from uh, your leadership within the state. <clears throat> we want to have as many technology options available. Uh, there's going to be different market and policy and regulatory incentives, technology innovation that has to happen to enable consumer adoption and sentiment around technologies. But in the end, we say that all technologies could be chosen economically based on their cost and performance. We see another option that starts to limit the availability of resources. Uh, so that's that bottom one, the limited options. In the limited options, we're seeing that there is no CO2 sequestration happening in this country by 2050. And that's a major challenge because today, more than 80% of the energy that we use as a society in the country comes from fossil fuels. So if we cannot investigate and invest in more energy efficiency, provide clean energy resources like RNG, like SAF, and then deploy CO2 capture and sequestration, we could drastically alter our primary energy resources. Again, 80% of that coming from fossil fuels today. It also shows that there's a big role for bioenergy. And so if we start to limit the use of energy crops, we could see a major shift in requiring more electrification. So hopefully those SMRs, hopefully more renewables come online, battery storage, hydrogen become more important in that scenario. And then the middle case is looking at higher fuel costs. We've seen over the last year, drastic changes in global market for natural gas due to the impacts in Ukraine. We're seeing that coming out of the COVID pandemic in Europe, Europe has invested heavily in their transition to a cleaner decarbonized future, putting a priority on hydrogen. So their investments are taking off quite rapidly. 
Uh, and now we're seeing in the U.S. the impacts, potential impacts of the IIJA and the Inflation Reduction Act uh, could play a huge role, even, even though the IRA is limited right now to that 10-year horizon from construction and, and operation. We're seeing that there's enough in there that if we can get the technology and the workforce, because the workforce is a major component of some of the tax incentives to get that $3 per kilogram credit, you can activate all of those aspects and pile on production tax credits from renewables, production tax credits from storage uh, and use for power generation, uh, then you can unlock, in some cases, some parts of this country, the equivalent of $4 per million BTU of hydrogen being produced. I didn't check today, but natural gas this week and last week's been around $6, $6.50 per million BTU. That's a pretty big, pretty big marker to, to be able to achieve. It's, it's out there, it's a potential, but there's still quite a ways we have to get there. Uh, Brett mentioned the cost of hydrogen. You know, there's some uh, incentives to get it cost. To me, hydrogen and playing its role, storage and delivery is gonna be a key enabler. Right now, we rely on vast networks and infrastructure, uh, underground and above ground, to uh, move and transport our fossil fuel resources. If we want a hydrogen future, we're gonna have to figure out how to do that on a large scale for hydrogen. Right now, we don't have that. That's where hydrogen hubs become a huge opportunity because they could show locally where you can use existing infrastructure, develop uh, lower risk existing or uh, new infrastructure and deploy hydrogen at scale. Brett mentioned that 20% by volume number. That's kind of a magic number that hydrogen, natural gas uh, end users are looking at to say, as he mentioned, uh, it's proven to be safe and uh, not require a lot of updates or changes to your equipment. To put that into perspective from the US economy, if we allowed all of the natural gas consumption in this country to have 20% by volume, it's not exactly possible, there's transmission limits, and Brett can talk about that way better than I can. But if we just said all of our natural gas consumption uh, came, 20% of it had by volume had hydrogen in it, that would require 100 gigawatts of renewable energy and, and electrolyzers to supply that hydrogen. We don't have that much renewable energy in this country today. We have approximately zero gigawatts of electrolyzers providing clean hydrogen in this country today. So there is a massive opportunity. Uh, but hydrogen doesn't fit all markets, doesn't fit all uh, infrastructure types, doesn't fit all customers, consumers. And so here, as was shown in the other graphs, that's where technology options really become important. And we're trying to balance uh, and help advance as many of these technology options because what works in Kentucky may not work in other places and vice versa. But we're excited to see that there's new investments, there's new energy behind CO2 capture and storage. There's plenty of viable opportunities there. We've seen it worldwide uh, that we can capture and, and safely store CO2 underground. Uh, we can also utilize it in some areas. But that we need a vast amount of energy resources to fuel this energy transition. And that's gonna require investments and technology deployment in uh, nuclear technologies, both the existing, getting those existing technologies out into uh, longer lifetimes, letting their licenses uh, extend so that as new technologies come on board, we can take those lessons learned and apply them to new SMRs and sustainable aviation fuels, renewable fuels. Can you mention one of the other aspects that I have uh, in my portfolio at EPRI is these net zero industrial clusters. We partnered recently with the World Economic Forum and Accenture to launch North America's decarbonizing industrial clusters effort uh, because recognizing that with these technologies, uh, there is limitations in the infrastructure and the deployment that we're gonna see at scale. We've built today's energy system in the US over about 100 years of investments and, uh, and asset deployment. We're trying to hit targets that are less than 30 years away and in all cases, we're limited by infrastructure. And so bringing together hubs or clusters of industries who have shared purpose and shared goals to try and mitigate risks, to share assets, and to learn about how these technologies deploy. And most importantly, at least to me, bring our communities together to understand those technologies and how it could benefit them from uh, all types of value, environmental, social, uh, and, and also economic, is really gonna be key drivers to making decarbonization happen uh, within our lifetime here and looking at the next 30 years. So I'm excited to be with you all today. And Kenya, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Wow, that's a lot at EPRI. Um, I think we're gonna have to talk more. <laughs> um, now we're gonna 
go into, I've got some questions, and then I see the audience has some questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, slow roll into the qu audience questions, and I'll, I'll tee up some first here. Um, the first one is to Brett. Um, so for NYSource, what is the primary driver, really, for NYSource looking at RNG and hydrogen? Um, is it just it's tech and it's innovative, or are you seeing uh, your customers actually start demanding different fuels? Yeah, I think you know we're a public utility, right? So there's all the investments that we make have to be prudent investments and, and enhance the value that we bring to our customers. Um, increasingly, we think we're we're starting to see that that value proposition for at least some of our customers includes some level of focus on environmental sustainability. You couple that with um, you know, the, the um, interest of our shareholders. We're a, public, a public, publicly traded company. Um, you all heard about the ESG wave of investing, and um, we think that's here to stay. And um, you're starting to see in the capital markets that um, you know, there's a preference for investing in companies that, um, that you know, have some kind of ESG strategy. And so we look at it really across all of our stakeholders, and we think that across the board, there's going to be a drive towards decarbonization. The pace of that, that decarbonization may be different from state to state, from locality to locality, um, but we think it's important that we're part of that, part of that transition. And like I mentioned before, we see RNG and hydrogen as, um, as tools that can be used not just within NYSource and our, and our Columbia Gas subsidiaries, but economy-wide to help drive that decarbonization at a lower cost than just electrification on its own. Um, and so using the assets that we have, along with this new innovative technology within RNG and, hydro with RNG and hydrogen, to help deliver a lower carbon solution to, to our customers. Thank you. Um, and Caitlin, to you, um, can you speak a little bit about, um, as you're looking at, at Clinch River and, um, well, TBA traditionally in Tennessee is very familiar, a lot of nuclear communities, it's not, it's not new, you know, there. But when you start to expand out into the valley, the, the importance and the messaging around nuclear and the NIMBY, but also workforce development, the workforce needs that you're going to see moving with advanced nuclear? Yes, great question. So um, some of the things that um, I've kind of seen the questions popping up too. So I think we'll hit a few of the audience questions with some of this. So um, uh, the, 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 the concern that comes up with with nuclear is there's always questions about you know um, safety and uh, but nuclear plants in general are um, you know they're they're non-carbon emitting they're uh, they're they're safely operated there's a lot of safety systems in place and planning and with the small modular reactors uh, the planning is is, uh, is 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 smaller for the size of the plant um, there's also uh, passive safe safety systems involved in small modular reactors. Currently operating reactors, they have active systems, they have operators to kind of keep things in check, whereas these new plants uh, will operate based on kind of the, the principles of physics. So a lot of the things that will drive safety systems are passive in nature. Um, so we're kind of working to get out and, and educate folks about that. There are big uh, economic development opportunities. Where, as we're looking at future sites, we're looking at previously uh, power generating sites. So in terms of the NIMBY, you know, they, they have had a power generating source in, in their backyard before, so it's just kind of more of the same. Um, but these, these facilities are also very well designed and well maintained. And about workforce, Caitlin, what um, kind of, I know you're involved in career yes. and, and that. <laughs> Workforce. We're obviously going to need a larger nuclear workforce, and I know NC State has a nuclear engineering program, the Wolfpack, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. But uh, w what's going to happen with um, kind of ramping up nuclear workforce? Yeah, so that's part of our process as well. So as we're looking at, you know, building a first and building a fleet, that's one of the strategies that we are working to develop, and that's a strategy from a workforce standpoint that's not going to just impact nuclear, there's workforce development opportunities, especially in construction space, 
for, for constructing all of our generating as, uh, assets. So um, workforce development is something that TBA is looking at and working on some big strategies for. All right, Seth, you mentioned um, the historic infrastructure funding and now, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act. What's the largest challenge you see, given that we've had um, a lot of movement in, in kind of policies for SAF, but the largest challenge in really moving SAF forward? And, and Seth and I have um, worked a lot on trying to get a production facility here That's in right. the state. What do you think it's going to take for us to get that SAF production here? So, Kenya, I think it's a, it's a great question. In terms of the biggest challenge, right, a lot of these things, again, going back to cost, right? This summer, uh, conventional Jet A hit the kind of post-pandemic high of about four, a little over $4 a gallon. SAF still remains, just again, because of limited supply, at about 8 to $9 a gallon. Um, so cost, I think, is still that challenge, and that's driven, obviously, by production, right? I think um, I, I mentioned earlier the SAF grand challenge uh, that the feds are really doubled down on, right? So that, that kind of strategy and framework outlines um, discrete uh, elements to get to 3 billion gallons of production by 2030 and then 35 gallon, billion gallons a year by 2050, right? Um, so the entire, at least US-based, um, scheduled kind of passenger and cargo uh, air system um, goes through about a billion gallons of fuel, uh, jet fuel a month, right? So we're going to need um, slacking capacity. We're going to obviously have to scale up capacity. And I think um, to your point about the Inflation Reduction Act, right, the SAP bl uh, Blenders Tax Credit, <coughs> there were incentives in that, uh, in the bill around both production and then consumption, right? So for end users of SAF, um, there's a, a per gallon credit that's variable based on how much whatever technology that produced the SAF creates you know, value in the GHG, it reduced GHG emissions. Um, so I think that's gonna be very impactful to try to get production scaled up but the real opportunity for Kentucky that I was so stupid to neglect to say before uh, is the idea of, right, California has been a leader in general, right, when we talk about many of these technologies in the transportation sector because of the low carbon fuel standard, right? So it was very much a, a regulatory approach uh, in the state and, and, and Oregon and Washington have, have looked at different things, which has incentivized right, many companies uh, where a lot of SAP production is taking place, right? Uh, so our counterparts at SFO and at the Port of Portland have really doubled down on, I see one of the questions about creating, you know, the airport or the aviation ecosystem having, you know, nearby resources or investments. It's because the stick approach, right? So what we're looking at and what we're advocating for in Kentucky is very much the carrot approach of, hey, if you did something similar to the feds and did somewhat of a stackable credit, both for the users of SAF at a, a um, per gallon kind of credit for a time, for a limited time, and you also really kind of amp up your capital investment credits, we think that both legacy folks like our friends at Marathon or others that are new to the space like Sunflower Fuels can really will have a, a, a much easier time when you think about the, the a massive amount of cost that it takes based on your feedstock to spool up uh, the blending of SAP here locally. And I think that will be the key to using it at scale at Louisville, at CVG, at other places, is if we can really co-locate or locate nearby the production facilities. And Seth, remind me, uh, the closest SAF production facility, it's? Chicago, well, Illinois. Illinois, Yeah. okay. Sites in Georgia too, but again, this can, we can be the, the Mid-South and the Midwest's production uh, capability here in Kentucky, but we gotta start moving on it. Right, and to Jeffrey, um, you spoke a lot of, I, I loved your charts, I love a good chart. Um, but we haven't heard a lot about EPRI's work on the storage side 
and touch a little bit more. Um, I know you're working uh, with LG and and KU mm -hmm. on some projects. Um, but what's happening kind of in the storage space? We hear a lot about batteries, but you know, there's pump storage, there's um, compressed air storage. There's a lot on the storage side that's going to have to happen um, for integration, I think, of uh, the renewables. So could you enlighten us, kind of like what EPRI's doing in that space? Sure. It's, it's an important point because uh, it's one thing to look at a 2050 scenario and, and kind of lay out the guideposts and the milestones to get there. But we can already look ahead to other countries and other regions of the world as to what types of challenges we might face. So in the UK and in Germany, certainly we've seen as they've ramped up their deployment of renewable energy, primarily solar and wind, uh, they've had issues with resource adequacy that have impacted their markets. Uh, and so we have a research portfolio looking at various aspects of energy storage, battery energy storage. We could get us to 8 to 12 hours of time shifting of those renewable energy assets. Uh, but as we deploy, and you know, generally, again, no crystal ball here, but when you hit the 30% renewable uh, capacity on the grid, it's where uh, in the interim right now when these costs for hydrogen and CCS and uh, new nuclear kind of are playing out uh, cost effectively yet, about that 30% mark is where we might need to deploy longer duration uh, technologies that get us above 12 hours. And I've heard some utilities mention that they're targeting uh, on the order of three days, three to four days, both from a, a resiliency aspect, so thinking about uh, a, a climate impacted event, a hurricane uh, or, or other otherwise, uh, but also at 30% renewables, intermittency be could, could become a challenge. We saw it in the UK last year where wind and solar dropped off over a period of three days uh, and they had to turn back to coal assets to provide that firm capacity. So uh, it, it, for those who don't know, there's more than 100 different technologies out there that could fit that three to four plus days before you get to hydrogen, which is uh, possibly a seasonal energy storage technology. And that could be thermal uh, units. They could integrate with existing thermal assets, nuclear, gas, or coal, and provide uh, that energy resource from a resiliency aspect uh, in the interim. Uh, could be gravitational. Uh, we already use pumped hydro as, as a mechanical means, uh, but there's a number of technologies out there that we're working with to investigate their role in, in certain uh, markets, certain grids. Uh, thermochemical, so heating up things and taking that energy uh, and, and creating steam, much like we do in our thermal plants, uh, and creating electricity that way. Uh, and so we're working with a number of our members to do cost and performance studies because it's very much uh, dictated on the asset mix and where these, um, these markets and these energy demand scenarios could take energy storage. But we've got a long ways, probably in, from an infrastructure at least standpoint before CCS and hydrogen and, and, and hopefully we'll get there soon with SMRs. Uh, but in the interim, as we deploy more and more renewables and we see uh, tax credits and other things continue to incentivize renewable energy, making sure that we have firm capacity available at some point uh, in the near future is going to be critical. Thank you. I think the word from this panel is optionality as, as, as we move into uh, at our uh, come to the close of the panel. Um, I'm going to close us out here with uh, some answers here to a few questions. We've got a lot of interest in SMRs and communities. Um, I'm going to do a plug. We're currently working with the Energy Communities Alliance. If you're not um, familiar with them, I, I would encourage you to go uh, look up Energy Communities Alliance. And we're working with the city of Paducah. We, uh, the city of Paducah with uh, the gaseous diffusion plant. Um, Paducah has a long history with nuclear and Kentucky does as well. We, we served a nuclear mission successfully. So we're going to be hosting a nuclear conference, uh, we think, I think next year. We're looking at, um, I think, later on in May. Uh, Barry Mayfield's helping me with it. And uh, we're working with uh, the Paducah Chamber to bring a national nuclear conference uh, to Kentucky where we're going to talk about what does nuclear mean in energy communities and uh, hear from communities as they talk about uh, dealing, one, with legacy nuclear assets, but then also um, how do we work collaboratively in our communities um, on new nuclear opportunities or just new economic development opportunities at some of the legacy sites. So stay tuned to that for us in, uh, in uh, May of next year. 
And I think, what else did I have? Did I have anything else? I think that's it for today. Um, please, uh, I do want to highlight some private sector partners in this space that are here today. Ms. Ramirez from Electro Dryer. Um, Ele Electro Dryer um, actually is working, I, I realized, with EPRI. Um, they actually dry hydrogen for use, and they're based here in Kentucky and are looking to expand into new R&D efforts. GE Gas Power was here as well, and you all, we, all, we all heard from the Jordan yesterday on BDO Zone. So be sure to seek out uh, some of these um, experts and learn more about what they do. Um, I'm fascinated by Electro Dryer, that they're located here in Kentucky and how they support uh, hydrogen uh, production and use in the state. So let's thank our panelists. And um, I get the joy of saying you get to transition into a break. So be back in 15.